wir so so we are being silent what about climate change when we're talking so it's not uh, they do the most important uh, new paper in germany they thought that the subject was very boring They've been talking in the last work about the refugee policy of Angela Merkel, and they haven't been talking about what really what we should really be afraid of is the overheating of the planet. But then is Monday, about four days ago, 22.15 in the evening. So Ingo Samperoni began the daily news with the words. So it doesn't matter which way you look at it, whether from the Earth or from the International Space Station, there is no plan B. We have this only one planet Earth, and humanity is, is, is busily destroying its own living conditions. And that's what you hear a lot of, not very much on the television. And on Tuesday and Wednesday, Inga Samperoni is talking about climate change again. And it's not just talking about just a note. And like another media, there's something is changing, ladies and gentlemen. And we are beginning to see that the things can't go on as they are, that all these uh, climatic, climatic conditions, that the lots the flight of people, people who are migrating all over the world, they're fleeing. And these are not abstract questions anymore. We are in the middle of the subject. A lot of people don't want to do this anymore. They, ten thousand, tens of thousands of people are demonstrating in Humbucker Woods, which is becoming a spotlight for the struggle about climate change. So something's going on, although within the government, there's not a lot going on at the moment, or at least not enough. When the EU, uh, w the when they're talking about the gas, uh, the gas has emissions from waters, from cars. Then they talk to you know, sort of like uh, that the so-called climate chancellor. Then not enough has been done. That's why we have to talk about it this evening. We're talking about it, how we can win the fight against climate change on the Earth. So now we're going to the 1.5, the limitation of. So thank you for coming all the this evening. My name My name is Hanna Gassmann. I'm a journalist here in Berlin and I'm going to be accompanying you for the next uh, couple of hours. Twitter again under 1.5 or under hashtag DeepWorld. So first of all I'm going to I'm going to uh, introduce uh, Barbara Unmusik, one of our who is the uh, president of the Heinrich Boll Foundation. So uh, Barbara Unmusik, you have the floor. So thank you very much uh, to Hannah for this uh, putting us in the mood and uh, you've uh, you put us in the you put us in the I'm I'm just going to thank you and welcome you on behalf of our three organizers, the Heinrich Boll Systems, Midoriz and BUND, which is Friends of the Art Germany, are the organizers of this event. And I think that it's a very good, strong alliance. And I'm very happy about this cooperation, that it's all worked out. And we do it for a lot of, in a lot of different areas. And for this event is an expression of this cooperation. And we have to unite our forces and we have to act together and I think it's uh, very small and I think it's also a lesson for civil society and we have to uh, work together so thank you to all of you who in were involved in the preparations of the conference I would like to thank uh, Mr. Rockstrom uh, heartily for taking the time to come to us this evening you know him from uh, Stockholm Resilience Center he's the protagonist and the the discoverer of the of the planetary boundaries he discovered this uh, concept so going to he's going to talk about it this evening and so and for those of you who don't already know mr. Rockstrom is going to fill the post uh, here that uh, the the management with mr. Hayhofer of the Potsdam Institute for the Klima Folgenforschung or climate impact research so I wish you much success and um, all the best for your new uh, post 
So the occasion for this uh, event is uh, the special report of the uh, IPCC, who on the who released the report a couple of days ago, and I think uh, we are waiting for it. We're waiting for it with much excitement because it wasn't really clear what the message of this report was going to be. The uh, for the IPCC, you've got to know that it's uh, a very big uh, group of people that's not just made up of uh, scientific people about climate, but also a committee that also that it has to be, uh, you know, stamped, signed off by politicians. So it's not just pure science that we're going to be present, is going to be presented, and it's not just going to be uh, circulated within the scientific community, like 1.5 degrees, maybe how we're going to get there, or how much, what, what are our budgets in uh, CO2 in order to attain 1.5. But I but, you know, I can say that for all of the three organizers here, I think we are very happy about the central message of this uh, latest report, uh, this special report. Uh, we can attain 1.5 because the central message is 1.5 are doable. That that we want to... And the, the report preconizes radical reductions in CO2. I've never heard it in, I've never really seen, I've, it, you know, a decarbonization of the world economy. I've never really seen that in a report before. And that they, they, they introduce this straight away. Uh, if we want to, we have to have a transformative way of uh, energy, traffic, uh, agriculture. We've got to change everything and not just in the energy branch. And it's also very important to us because we are environmental and nature protection organizations that when we attain 1.5, we have to get there. We have to, we have, to have the already existing and functioning um, uh, uh, ecosystems in order to be able to maintain all of this. And we've really got to keep investing to get this, that. So, so. So we've got to make sure that the ecosystems, that the ecosystems uh, don't get damaged anymore and that they can recover if we make the effort, and we already know, and that was one of the good things in the report of the last couple of days. 1.5 are absolutely necessary because every every tenth of a degree is very important, is significant for climate change and for people and for the limit damages on the ecosystems. The newer research in on that is in this special report on climate change shows that we we have that we have we have attained two the two degrees we can't we we cannot consider this as being absolutely uh, sure 1.5 heat of a, of a heating we're at one we're at one at the moment but it's already got many risks for humans and for ecosystems and we're not talking about risks we're talking about life and death for many people who live in who who drown in floods or who die in storms or who lose their homes and so forth we already know as well and that is that's the result of newest research also from the Potsdam Institute from the Alfred Wegener Institute in Bremerhaven that between 1.5 and 2 degrees of we that we we can we have to deal with the melting of the pole cap so this is one of these you know sort of like switch points or swing points that has a cascade type of effect and we can't de we don't even know how it's going to work out at the end all of these effects and this is why we know that in the next in the next couple of years or in the next coming years between 1.5 and 2 we have to really stop the the increase at 1.5 and 2 when we want to avoid the swinging of the system into the other system with you know sort of like with many sort of like you know sort of like a uh, lot of uh, rising of the sea level by several meters etc so what do we want to attain with this event this evening what what's our message that we have to insist on the necessity to act and it's been more urgent now than ever before. Thank you, Mrs. Gersman, to for having evoked the way, you know, sort of like how dreadful it is, even for the the federal government that in the middle of this uh, special report of the UN uh, panel on climate change, that it's going to be very clear how much how much uh, Germany has become a break for the climate. And what I mean here is that with the EU, with ambitious targets at the next, uh, when they're going to the next uh, Euro uh, European climate conference in Katowice, and when we're talking about, they're talking about radic radical um, emission uh, targets for 
for private vehicles and all of this is this week and this is irresponsible and it's uh, irresponsible with respect to the future and also as well our uh, task as the civil society is to make it very clear to the government that it's a re it's a refusal to look at the reality and it's a policy that is going to be implemented at the cost of current and future generations due to ignorance you can also when you this ignorance, it's, it's very extreme. Uh, even when, Mer you know, even if, uh, you know, M Mrs. Merkel likes to appear as, you know, a woman of the masses or, you know, in, in favor of the uh, climate, but this uh, r refusal of reality is extreme. So this evening, uh, this event, we would also like to tell you that the climate crisis is not the only crisis in the world, but it but it has multiple uh, cross-cutting reasons. We have, we've, we've also really got the, we've already overstepped the planetary boundaries. We've got massive uh, inequality and increasing inequality. And the three thing, the third thing for us, the third great crisis, is the destruction of democracy, of democratic spaces, and the increase in autocracy and nationalism, closing spaces for civil society overall in the world, and makes it very difficult to uh, drive this struggle against the world. And to make it clear to the authorities that it can't go on like before. And we have to do this very clearly this evening. We have to think together about this crisis because we can't find it, invent a solution that is at the costs of, of the resolving other crises. I think it's very important that these crises have to be seen as intricately woven together. And I'm just going to give you an example here. What type of, what type of uh, farming do we need or agriculture we know we, we need to get out of industrial agriculture with you know high input uh, high input of dung and pesticides and emissions uh, we have we have an extremely powerful and uh, indus agro industry and we know that there are activists who don't you know sort of like who are you know sort of like fighting against the robbing of land and uh, they've been they've been pro pro they've been prosecuted and persecuted by autocratic uh, autocratic regimes uh, for the struggle against land robbing and the sort of like the strengthening or the, the interweaving of strength between uh, industrial companies and between states is very strong. And the technology that should actually uh, help us and to help us to, you know, sort of like, you know, like Bex, you know, sort of like, as you can have very negative effects here because with this technology, you know, sort of like it should be. It sh first of all, that it's supposed to generate energy. This energy must has to be collected as a storage uh, of uh, CO2 emissions uh, that are created due to the energy creation and then afterwards that they're going to pressure them into the ground and in order to do this we need a lot of a lot of biomass and this biomass the production of energy and then sort of like then you press the you press the um, CO2 emissions back into the ground but this is going to lead to the fact that there's going to be con conflict uh, in the use of land, there's going to be a loss of biodiversity, which is going to be increased again. And when we're talking about large technologies here, that isn't, isn't you know, sort of like, isn't a decentralized thing, and it's not about the sort of like developing countries and for poor and people, but it's going to be a new concentration of power in these technological firms. And this is not going to be a good thing either. We all know that we, we need different guidelines for reductions in order to attain the target of 1.5 we have and that's the foundation has published a study on this but we've already seen you know sort of like even the IP, even if we find that the ipcc uh, uh, report is good that we do see that there's a lot of the model modelization in the ipcc are we you know, sort of like that we have to continue to produce and consume as before. And that I think it's a little bit of a paradox, and I hope that we're going to talk about this this evening, that we are in a limited world we're not, where, we can, where we can continue to have unlimited growth and use raw materials. We just can't do this anymore because... We we cause problems on site. We have um, uh, we cause emissions on site, and also we also uh, we also bring people into very unequal conditions. And so, when we have this type of production in the world, this the, we also want to talk this evening about inequality and sufficiency. 
how do we get to the point that that less is more and we how can we as it developed to imagine an economic system that the planetary boundaries are to be used as a norm and uh, for politics and for economics. That's what we're going to talk about this evening. So just very shortly, and I hope that that we have the copies here, the publish publications of the three organizations for the Heinrich Böll Stiftung. We have this, we've realized, we've carried out this uh, short study and about the uh, economic modelization that uh, that the IPCC used, and we have a collection of texts on the subject about on the base for a lot of people, unbelievable amount of people on this world, how radical uh, radical uh, emission reduction can happen, and also we can pr we can at the same time produce equality. So we've g gathered a lot of texts here, and you can gather you compilation of texts. So you can bring them with you. And I also think I'm also going to talk about Miserior and uh, the Bund and the Heinrich Boll, uh, so that the target of 1.5 degrees is attainable. That's what the special report made very clear. We have to rise to this challenge very fast in a radical manner and at the same time in a social manner. Uh, we, we three organizations, we, we, we want this uh, social and eco ecological environmental justice, and I wish you a very, very fruitful discussion here, and I'm going to give the word back to Henry Tan. Thank you, Mrs. Anmusik. So we can change things, but this change are really, really n necessary. That's what uh, Barbara Anmusik has really said. That's what the report, the IPCC report, but what does this mean exactly? And what do we have to do on a political level? So, so Johann Rockström can explain this the best, one of the most famous sustainability scientists in the world. So you said, we, we haven't heard you so many of, uh, so much in German before. This is going to change now that you're working in the Potsdam Institute. So please welcome Johann Rockström. So, guten Abend and Entschuldigung, especially in Deutsch, so I'll be doing this in English. It is, um, as Barbara pointed out, a very special week. It's actually a week where we have to remember what happened just three years ago. At the end of the Paris Climate Agreement, we were at a state, actually, where it was very unlikely even that we would get the number two into the legally binding climate agreement. 1.5 was seen as a concession to the low-lying island states, a political, diplomatic way of enabling all the nations to get on board. In fact, there was a sense of uncomfort that we had to put on the IPCC table the need to do an assessment for a temperature that we did not really recognize as a global catastrophic potential risk limit, nor was it really relevant to do the science behind it. Today, just three years later, we're sitting on so much scientific evidence that 1.5 is the new planetary guardrail. It is the limit that we have to guide ourselves to if we are going to stand a chance for a sustainable future for humanity. It's particularly reassuring for me personally because already 2009, we published the first planetary boundary science and the planetary boundary for climate is 1.3 degrees Celsius. And we have, uh, so to say, concluded that there's scientific support for a very careful temperature level for a long, long time. And the IPCC, which I respect tremendously, in fact, I have many of my colleagues at the Potsdam Institute as leading authors of this report that was released this Monday, is one has to recognize, as Barbara pointed out, the minimum common denominator in science. And it is, in the end, even going through a osmotic filter, uh, say colliding with, with policy. So you can rest assured that the IPCC is the floor we stand on. It's not the frontier of the science. Now remember, and Barbara pointed this out, we have reached 1.1 degrees Celsius warming. I tend never anymore to say just we've reached one degree Celsius warming. The message is we are at the warmest temperature on Earth since the last ice age. We've hit the ceiling. We are at the warmest point since 12,000 years ago when we were in the last ice age. In fact, we're coming to a point where we're reaching the edge of interglacials over the entire Pleistocene era, which is the last 1.2 million years. This is why we can today, with very high degree of certainty, 
say that 2018 will go into history as the first time we see anthropogenic global warming amplifying extreme events hitting across the entire world from the floods and the impacts associated with all the way from the forest fires in California, the floods occurring across Japan with over 200 deaths related to this, this event in January or in, in June, the droughts in Australia in the middle of the winter, the forest fires in Australia, which are still going on actually, over 20 fires going on as we speak, Canada with also heat waves and floods, the enormous, tremendous flooding in Kerala, which in fact led to the entire destruction of the whole Kerala state that has to be rebuilt from zero. The enormous heat waves with the highest temperature ever recorded on the African continent, 51.2 degrees Celsius. The European heat wave you saw. In my own home country, we have to rewrite all the geography books because the highest point in the country has now been bypassed because of glacial melting. And President Barack Obama's final exit from the White House was to gather Arctic scientists in the Glacier Conference to remind that a two degrees Celsius warming on the planet means five degrees Celsius warming in the Arctic. Now, that I think is really important because even a climate skeptic, potentially even a climate denialist would agree that five degrees is not a good place. <laughs> and we are actually facing that in the northern parts of the hemisphere already at two degrees Celsius because of climate amplification. This, dear friends, is what we're starting to see already currently on the pathway we're heading towards. I would argue that the most important scientific message to humanity over the last 20 years can be shown in this equation. And I'm here going to do exactly what Barbara, in a way, pointed out, to set the 1.5 report in a wider context. 1.5 and climate is a crisis, but it's set in the context of Earth system stability. Because scientifically we know today and this is very painful to say, but the final battleground, whether we will fail or succeed with Paris, is not whether we will be able to get rid of fossil fuels. We focus all our attention there. But decarbonizing the world's energy system, believe it or not, is the easier of the tasks. The final battleground will be if we're able to manage the natural ecosystems and the biosphere on planet Earth whether we can stay within planetary boundaries on nitrogen, phosphorus, water, land, and particularly biodiversity, because that is where the resilience is. That is where the carbon sinks are. That's where the absorption capacity and the ability of the Earth system to keep the planet stable. And these three insights come from the advancements of Earth system science over the last 10 years. Number one, which you're well aware, that we have all the scientific evidence today that we've entered a whole new geological epoch where we are the largest driver of change on planet Earth. We are in the Anthropocene. Secondly, that the Holocene, the interglacial phase since the last ice age, the last 12,000 years, is the only equilibrium state of the planet we know for certain can support in an ethically responsible way a modern world as we know it. If we want to take responsibility for all our co-citizens, 7.6, soon to be 9 billion people, the Holocene is the only state we know for certain can support us. And finally, that things do not change linearly and thereby incrementally and in a predictable way. Oh no, the Earth is so resilient, so during long time periods it can in fact change only incrementally because it can buffer unsustainable abuse until a certain point where systems break and abruptly shift feedbacks and gets to a self-amplifying point, what we call tipping points. When you add these three insights together, the next incremental step is naturally planetary boundaries. Because of course, if we are the biggest driver of change, of course, if we have the Holocene as our desired Eden's garden state of the planet, and of course, if we risk catastrophic nonlinear change, two questions arise. What are the environmental processes we need to cater for to stay stable? And secondly, what are the quantitative targets within which we can have a safe operating space where we can have a chance for the future, but beyond which we risk to destabilize the Earth system? So that is the planetary boundary framework. It was not a big jump from nothing. It was really, as Isaac Newton would have said at this point, standing on the shoulder of giants, taking the next little incremental step in science, given all the evidence we have. We've transgressed four of the nine boundaries, and it's quite important to recognize it is on nutrients, it's biodiversity, it's on land, and on climate. So we are at a state where things are interacting in the wrong direction. Now, 
on tipping elements, I can reassure you that the last 20 years, and particularly from, from German science, and uh, if I may do some uh, uh, marketing for my new own institute, the Potsdam Institute, have been leading the work on tipping elements across the Earth system, recognizing and mapping out where are the risks for abrupt changes, like, for example, the risk of massive scale forest dieback in the Amazon, which would be a pulse of carbon that would add tremendous additional climate forcing. Or, for example, even the changes in temperate and boreal forests, the Greenland ice sheet, of course, the Antarctica, but systems across the planet that have these nonlinear changes with multiple equilibrium states. We know today that if we start forcing the warming, even at low temperatures, perhaps even below 2 degrees Celsius, we risk triggering the first set of tipping points, here in yellow, which could couple in domino effects and start a process which becomes irreversible that could take us towards a hothouse Earth state. We estimated the scientific knowledge just a few months back showing that even at 2 degrees Celsius warming, even from a conservative assessment, the biosphere is at risk of bumping us up another half degree. Well, if you bump us up from two to, ha to two and a half, meaning that we don't only become the emitters of greenhouse gases, even nature becomes an emitter, then the 2.5 point could in turn trigger the next set of domino pieces, which then could get us rolling in the wrong direction. Not that we would, so to say, fall off a cliff over a decade, but we would, in the next decade, press the on button, committing all future generations over the next 300 years into an irreversible journey of amplified warming. Ethically, that of course is, I think from all of our perspective, an unacceptable future. So this is why we've come to a completely new point. Because two degrees Celsius, just a few years back, was kind of, yes, not a very attractive global temperature rise, but it was like a bit a bit more adaptation needs than one degree. It was kind of along a linear trajectory of larger costs for society. That is scientifically no longer the case. Two degrees may be the point where we tip over from a resilient Earth system to a non-resilient Earth system, from a friend to a foe, from a self amplifying state that could take us in a state that we can no longer manage. That is why there's so much scientific support for 1.5 to stay away, as far as we ever can, from two. We have then translated the Paris Agreement of staying below two into the global carbon law, which is the first attempt of showing what pathway do we have to follow to stand a chance of coming back to a safe operating space. This global carbon law, inspired by the Moore's law, you know, Gordon Moore, who in 1965 predicted the doubling of of speed on computers every 18 to 24 months, which became a, a self-fulfilling prophecy of innovation, we think that could actually guide a disruptive transformation towards a decarbonized future. The carbon law follows the mitigation pathways coming out of the IPCC in the run-up to Paris, which shows in gray here, these are global emissions of greenhouse gases in gray from fossil fuel burning and land use, that we have to bend the curve of emissions no later than 2020, so in two years' time. That's Christiana Figueres' big mission in life, you know, she who took us to Paris, the former head of the United Nations Framework Convention, and then follow a pace of reduction which translates itself, if you follow this pace, of cutting the emissions by half every decade. So cutting by half every decade, a carbon law can take us safely under two degrees Celsius. But that is not enough. What you see in dark brown here is that agriculture, the food system, the single largest emitter of greenhouse gases, must transition from being a net source to becoming a net sink of greenhouse gases, an agricultural revolution. But not even that is enough. We then have to, and I'm sure this will be a discussion tonight, in the yellow parts there, is that all the integrated assessment models assume negative emission technologies to be able to stay within a safe carbon budget. And as Barbara pointed out, are these sustainable? Can we really have CCS and BECs and different forms of technologies that can be operating in a sustainable and ethical way to be discussed? And then, as if that was enough, sorry, it's not. In green and blue, it is we have to keep the natural carbon sinks intact, the negative emissions in nature. And if we do all of this, we have a 66% chance of success. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> I mean, 
that, in my mind, is like, is like the punch in the stomach. I mean, the number one punch. I mean, it's, it's a punch in the sense that it makes you very concerned, but it's also a reminder that the 1.5 degrees Celsius future is a global sustainability transformation. It's an equitable, social inclusive transition to a completely new paradigm where sustainability is the guiding principle for everything. It's not only about decarbonizing the energy system, because otherwise we will fail even on climate. So that's why the 1.5 degree Celsius report is so important. It basically underwrites this whole agenda. In fact, if you read it carefully, it says we have only 10 years left. We have 10 years left under the current emission pathways. We need to have net zero by 2050. We have to cut the emissions over the next decade. It adopts the global carbon law. And it says honestly that the only way this can work is that non-CO2 gases go even faster down, methane and nitrous oxide. And it says very carefully that we have biosphere carbon feedbacks if we don't take care of nature that would bump up another 100 gigatons of carbon dioxide and we have not even included that in our carbon budgets. So my message tonight, which is the first time I kind of want to really communicate that, is that 1.5 is the new 2. 1.5 is the new 2. We have come to a point where we really have to now truly communicate to the world that the safe boundary for humanity is 1.5, and therefore that is our task in the future. The report is extraordinary. For the first time we see, if you look here to the left, furthest to the left, that this, this purple color here is high risk of irreversible tipping points for warm coral reef systems at 1.5. Science has been saying this for so long. Now IPCC confirms that we're very likely, in fact, unfortunately, very likely, to lose all coral reefs on Earth already at 1.5. So it is even that, a dangerous level. Remember that we are at one degree, degree Celsius, the warmest point of the Holocene. We are doing a lot of research and trying to find what are the pathways then to the future. One of them is led by Naoko Ishii, the head of the Global Environment Facility, sitting on 1.5 million billion US dollars for investments in sustainable ecosystem management to redefine the global commons. How do we manage these biome systems that we talk so often in terms of conservation, but now need to recognize as being resilience builders for a 1.5 degree Celsius future? So we have to really integrate the thinking of the Earth system. Now, I just want to share with you before closing something that takes the 1.5 to really broader context. So, if the big challenge is to attain the sustainable development goals illustrated here in this circle, the question is, can we do that within a stable Earth system, within 1.5 degrees Celsius and all the planetary boundaries? I'll be sharing this with you as a peak peak insight as well, because this has never been published, and it will be published on the 17th of October. So. Please don't, don't tweet now <laughs> for the next five minutes. This will actually be presented at the Club of Rome's 50-year conference, the 17th of October in Rome. So it is actually built on the World 3 model. It is the MIT Donella and Dennis Meadows World 3 model that we've upgraded to call an Earth 3 model. The first time of integrating the world economy with the dynamics of the Earth system, all planetary boundaries and the SDGs to do an attempt of exploring, can we meet the SDGs within planetary boundaries, okay? So here comes the, the, the story of this. So what you have on the y-axis is our ability to stay within planetary boundaries. So the higher up you are, the more of the planetary boundaries are we able to, to not transgress, okay? So you want to be as high as up as ever possible. And on the x-axis, you have the sustainable development goals. The further to the right, the more sustainable development goals are we, are we meeting. So the better is the social, equitable future for humanity. Now this is the journey from 1980 until today. This is empirics, this is 100,000 data points from seven regions in the world showing how we have quite successfully, so to say, gradually delivered a little, little bit better and better on sustainable development goals at the expense of the planet. So we're just transgressing boundary after boundary after boundary on our journey towards economic growth and development. This is the drama. We have a resilient planet that does not send invoices back to humanity, and we have just exploited, and we get short-term benefits, but the planet, 
our best friend sits there and just takes more and more pressure. And 2018 may be the point where it started to send invoices. Now, if we push this forward as a business as usual future to 2030 and 2050, it looks like this. So economic growth can continue. We will deliver, improve delivery on sustainable development goals, but as you see, at the expense of planetary boundaries. So business as usual takes us to a point where we just transgress more and more and more and risk of catastrophic tipping points. We even explored a future where we increase economic growth even further and where we actually have a three times larger world economy. And of course, it takes us a little bit better on SDGs, but the planetary boundaries suffer even more. If we then instead adopt a series of disruptive transformations, I mean, really deep, deep transformations, testing what will it take? And this is a new growth paradigm. It is about sustainable, healthy food chains. It's about redistributing of, of, of wealth in a sense that the 10% richest must never have more than 40% of wealth in nations and dramatic investments in girls and demographics and capacity development to balance population at uh, maximum 9 billion people. And if you put this in the model, we come to a point where we are able to start moving up into this desired corner. Now, the point here is not to say that we've found the solution in any way. The point is that to say nothing less than deep disruptive transformation is required. We are beyond the point of incremental change to stand any chance of moving in the right direction. And we'll be debating this, and I hope we can debate that a lot. Now, to close, just to give you a little bit of, of light in the tunnel then, a few weeks back, together with Christiana Figueres, I opened the Global Climate Action Summit that you know Jerry Brown and Michael Bloomberg hosted in San Francisco. We then presented the Exponential Climate Action Roadmap with the 30 solutions for 2030, showing what's happening in the world if you take a positive look of developments. Now, it's quite interesting. Even I was quite shocked, actually. This is just the data that we kind of discuss a lot on solar voltaics and wind, which shows that over the last 15 years, these are the empirical data up till 2015 on the x-axis, shows that we're doubling wind and solar globally every fourth year. Every fourth year. Now, on the y-axis is electricity supply globally. It's not all energy, it's electricity. And if you just prolong the, 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 that doubling every fourth year, we would follow this line. A more realistic journey follows this line, which means that we would, in, in 12 years' time, in 2030, be able to supply 50%, 50% of global electricity from solar and wind. And that is slower than the pace of adoption over the last 15 years. So simply put, even if we follow just the current pace of increase, we would have over half of global electricity from solar and wind, under current business as usual. Remember, we are on exponential journeys. In fact, we're exponential journeys even on the number of countries that have adopted different types of policies for carbon pricing and decoupling. This graph here shows the number of countries that have decoupled economic growth from emission of greenhouse gases. It's 49 countries today, and it's predicted to be over 50 countries in a few years' time. Most science shows that when you have a large enough minority, you can tip, tip the majority. 50 countries is 25% of the world's countries. We could be at a point where David can really tip over Goliath because we know that when a large enough minority shows the benefits, something can start happening. We show also that we can cut emissions by half until 2030 in different sectors. This came out three weeks before the 1.5 degree Celsius report and is built working with Project Drawdown and Paul Hawkins and really the empirical data across the world showing that it is possible sector by sector to reach much, much further than we thought. So in conclusion, the sustainable development goals, the 17 aspirational goals for human prosperity and social inclusion in a universal agenda is a good agenda. But they cannot be dealt with as they tend to be, I would argue, like a, like a Swedish smurgos board, where you, know, you pick your goodies and just do a little bit of your favorites. No, scientifically, this, this should be translated, what I've called, I'll jump, well, this is actually uh, my little critique on my fellow um, Norwegians who, um, 
you know, were, were the leaders. I, I'm a great admirer of Gro Harlem Brundtland, who brought the sustainable development paradigm to 1992 Rio conference with the three pillars, the social, ecological, economic pillars. But you know, it has failed. We just have to admit it turned into a Mickey Mouse economy, which is, you know, that the, the economy has grown very well, thank you very much, at the expense of natural capital and uh, social capital and that this has to be broken, and that in fact we need what I've called the wedding cake. We need to recognize that the Sustainable Development Goals have four fundamental non-negotiables. The planetary boundaries, Goal 6, 13, 14, 15. Water, biodiversity, climate, and oceans. And if we can really get the social, economic, and equity agenda to occur within that safe operating space, then I think we have a chance to transform to a safe and equitable future for humanity. And that this is the paradigm shift which is so difficult that we have to put the sustainable development goals within the planetary boundaries. And at that point we can have this paradigm shift that hopefully can unlock planetary stewardship and global commons into a future that is what we all, I think, really desire and hope for. So I, I really look forward to discussing this, and uh, I'm so glad to be in my new home country here in Germany. Thank you. <laughs> Johan. <laughs> Thank you very much for sharing your insights with us. Great work. Um, we open up directly. Are there any questions? Have you irgendwelche Fragen direct to the Vortrag? Von Johann Rockström. Wir haben Zeit für ein bis zwei Fragen. Ich sehe da im Moment keinen. Johann, dann habe ich eine Frage. Wer schreibt... Dort, dort. Bitte schön. Ich sehe das so schlecht hier. Ja. Äh, mich würde interessieren, äh, inwieweit jetzt in diesem IPCC-Sonderbericht äh, neuere Erkenntnisse, wie zum Beispiel Ihre Studie mit äh, Steffen und Rockström, uh, to the with the the uh, the planetary tipping points were they taken into account in this report the ipcc has said that there's that there are there's a new emis emissions budget and and as far as i know so the ipcc has uh, has you know sort of like has taken you know sort of like the overall has taken over all the reduction in its uh, calculations but it hasn't taken into it hasn't really taken into account wh where the tipping point really occurs so how can you rely on these figures to what extent can you rely on the figures that are in the report you know is it 600 or 800 uh, you know sort of like gigatons you know sort of like is it it could be it could be worse i doubt the figures in fact for that it's a very important question and, and uh, if you read the report carefully you will find which one has to be very clear about that it's incredibly complex to uh, um, you know to define the remaining allowable global carbon budget to stay within 1.5 it is it is uh, associated with so many assumptions and so many difficult points all the way from what is the reference year for your mean temperature on Earth, all the way to the, all the assumptions on climate forcing, non-CO2 gases, biosphere carbon feedbacks. But what is so, the, the, the great accomplishment with this report is that it comes to the conclusion that the, that the range, the, the uncertainty range, is between 420 and 560 gigatons of carbon dioxide. And so however you twist and turn that, and you divide that by 50, which is our annual emissions today, you end up with 10 years. You end up having, you know, it could be 9, 10, 11, but essentially we're talking of, of, a, of a decade under current emissions. And I would say that that is a, a careful conservative assessment. It could actually be zero. It could be twice as big, but it could also be zero. Because it could be zero. How could it be zero? Well, it could be zero if we are not able to transform the agricultural system in the world, so we're not able to bend the methane and nitrous oxide. And if uh, permafrost releases a little bit more methane, then it turns into zero. So, and, and why is this so? Well, because the numbers are so small. You know, there's basically no budget left. And I tried to communicate, as I did with Ottmar Edenhofer in The Guardian just a few days back, that... As soon as you are at, at a point where, where we have less than 10 years budget left, then we are at a shorter time span than even the minimum investment cycle. You know, think of it, even if, if someone here in this room is planning to buy a car, even that car has a longer investment cycle than 10 years. 
and, and think of a coal-fired plant, therefore. So the budget, even in the uncertainty range, is so small that we now just need to phase out from fossil fuels. I think it is, despite the uncertainty, is very reassuring. So we're going to get back to you. We're, we're going, to, going to continue further. We're going to have the opportunity to discuss this afterwards. Johan Rockström, in the IPCC, are there people there who are critical of uh, uh, growth or are they, are they, uh, are they dogmatic uh, economists? Are there people there who question uh, growth? Mm. Does not address the growth uh, challenge in this report. And I think the IPCC should not do that, really, because they should provide us with exactly what they've done, namely the, the basic biophysical assessment. And, and you could cr criticize the IPCC report for not translating uh, the urgency into the implications of that urgency, which, which must address the issues of growth, for example. But it does not do that. Actually, it is quite uh, weak, I would argue, on all forms of equity, policy, economic changes. Uh, what are the implications for different sectors? So it, it, uh, but I, I don't think that I don't think we should expect that from the IPCC report. Okay, but we had people who could do it very well. We've got people who can do it. First of all, thank you very much, Mr. Rockstone. We're going to talk to you again later. And. I know there's going to be one person who's uh, an IPCC uh, economic skeptic and one of the most important experts in Germany, in uh, Germany, in the point, is Angelica Start, who's a, an economic scientist and who also, who was also at the uh, is interested in economic tax, in, in eco taxes, and also is the the president of uh, this association and this explains her idea of politics so she has you can have you can have a good life with a new definition of what is enough so and we like a please hello good evening i think that we're all very impressed uh, from the presentation given by uh, Mr. Rockström about the results, the alarming results of the of climate research. And the question is when we are going to, when, you know, what's, what's the baseline scenario is going to, be, going to be like if this was going to continue and if we want to avoid that, then the conclusion of climate research is, and I'm going to cite the, from the Resilience Center, we have to we have to have the, we have to have human commerce in a different direction. We have to have it from robbery. We have to have a proper, responsible way of dealing with the Earth system, as Mr. Rockstrom formulated it. But my point is yet, and uh, I'm, I was this was also talked about in your question. What what's what's in the IPCC report about growth? And I'm going to give you. And there is something in there, but it's not prominent if you look at it, but you can you can see it if you look closely enough. The question is what what's the what does the IPCC do with these climate scenarios? What do they uh, derive from this from climate protection scenarios? How, how should poli politi how should politics react to that? And there are five different scenarios for protecting the climate that were worked on with different models. And of these five scenarios, the the just until one, the so-called catastro catastrophic scenario, the uh, assumption was is that on a world that there's going to be worldwide growth, uh, economic growth. That was just was just assumed because the the well-being is understood as being the in increase of consumption per head, and so this is our economic goal. And and when you assume this, and you can sort of like you can have a temporary overshoot of the critical thresholds. You can't you can't avoid it in that case. So this is why uh, risky technologies like uh, geoengineering, 
and so who takes a, a atmosphere who sort of like sucks the sucks the CO2 out of the atmosphere and at the, the current time this bioenergy with carbon capture and storage is so you sort of like if you grow biomass so and then you burn the biomass and so you can store CO2 with it this process these are climate protection scenarios that are in the IPCC report and they also and they assume further economic growth and if you have a sustainable scenario for 2010 to 2000 uh, for the industry con industrial countries if you've got an overall economic growth of 1 to 1.4 percent growth of the of GDP and so o over the world it's 2.1 to 2.2 percent is assumed but the question is that's just left open is how does that so what's the relationship between economic growth and climate protection and well, what's the relationship between these two concepts and so we can ask what experience do we have since then and sort of like uh, in rio in 1992 and since kyoto climate protection you know is really a a, a very political uh, target of uh, society and a very ambitious target so we really have to have economic growth on the world and further growing co2 emissions in industrial lands it has to be a decoupling uh, so you have to have improved we didn't do, succeed in having improved economic uh, performance with uh, re co2 reduction in industrial countries that uh, you know sort of like you've got the you've got the delocalization of uh, production and then the import importing of CO, of consumer goods that leads to CO2 emissions. You know, sort of like if we d if we don't if we don't produce the carbon dioxide here, then we delocalize the production. And in these threshold and sort of like in development countries, emerging and development country developing countries, they've got a double effect, which is negative. And the hope that you know, sort of like we can attain uh, through energy efficiency, we can attain a green economy. And we can also have, uh, we, but with the same economic, uh, and in order to attain national uh, targets, we've, uh, we have, they, we can't attain this due to the so-called rebound effect, and it's for the future. This is not realistic. The federal government here that has wonderful targets and wonderful plans about sustainability, they, so. So they have the 40, so they reduce the target of 40% by 2052, of 2035 to 35. And, and in European uh, climate policy, we uh, were one of the, f at the forefront, forefront, and now we've become a break, and as we saw in the EU summit last week. And then we were talking about the reduction of CO2 emissions in the automobile industry, and why this? Why did we have? Why did we have this brake function? Because the automobile industry in Germany is very, very prominent, and we don't want losing jobs, and reducing growth. And why in the Hambacher Wood? You know, sort of like why? Sh why are we producing? Uh, why are we producing coal there? This type of energy form, because we're talking about the profitability of energy groups and uh, votes and growth and i remember there was a very relevant phrase of the former um, mr clayman the economics minister he was talking said this in the 2000s when they were talking about the 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 introduction of the emissions trading he said about the climate change so he said and how much he was for climate change but of course of course, the climate change had to be considered as being uh, uh, under economic growth, and that's a that's still a for this it's still a formulation that's still in, very current in the political world today. Is that th that it's the, you know it's the climate protection has actually been sort of like uh, you know sort of like been we have to increase the targets. And the inc the Im improvement of targets was also met with German resistance. And I would like to insist on the fact that you can reconcile growth and climate protection, environmental protection, also through um, renewable energies. But uh, uh, climate protection shouldn't be dependent on growth. 
the our, the planetary boundaries are our human boundaries, and they, the w the economy must be organised in such a way, even if it means uh, changing our economic system or if we have to change the paradigm of economic growth. That the you know sort of like that uh, economic uh, laws have to be changed, and the law you know sort of like. We've got less, you know, we've got le we, we can influence laws on the economy, but we can't really influence the climate. So we need, we need to, we need to get away from economic growth. We need to change the paradigm. We need to attain an economy that's not as, de that's not as dependent on an economic growth. We have to get into a post growth era and we have to improve living standards. This debate. This is debate. This debate isn't new. It's been going on about this since 1972. The debate comes on the table all the time, and we all we keep trying to to continue this debate and with new words and to harm, you know, sort of like harmonize things. We were talking about, uh, you know, harmonizing slogans like, you know, sort of like sustainable development or sustainable growth. And, you know, sort of like that we've moved on to since the 70s. We've got the SDGs, w which we find this concept again. And the difference we and the time of the of the dependency of uh, society and economy on growth, but this is central for the climate policy. This is my this is my personal experience as we were talking about it earlier. The studies on growth, and uh, we were <laughs> so that shows uh, that sort of like I've been sort of like. Uh, from this uh, German, which Germany, which is capable of facing the future, they did a study on post-growth uh, for highly developed industrial countries like Germany, and we were trying to Im implement this in to translate this into concrete uh, data, and how you would do this, and you can still see the same reduction targets for CO2 and for uh, raw materials. This was very progressive at the time, very uh, wide-reaching uh, targets until 2050. But what's astounding is is that there was no no special chapter on growth, and and the reason for this was that we always always assumed that that with Rio that this uh, planet planetary boundaries and uh, the concept of offscore and climate protection should have such a priority that that we didn't have to ad explicitly address growth, that it was completely clear that within this environmental spa space that we're talking, within these planetary boundaries, if we have to live there and that the, the, the so we have to, so we have to get to not an explicit uh, target fixation. There were no targets were explicitly fixed at the time. It was just assumed, sort of like that you don't have to deal with. Uh, there was an assumption that you had to deal with uh, economic growth, and this was an error at the time. So whether so once about you know sort of like surface use with uh, pesticides use, there was always there was always you know sort of set against uh, economic growth, and for the most. The priority was always given to economic interests and not to the respect of uh, climate protection or environmental protection targets. So the debate on we have to we have to really get a f uh, sort of like a very uh, offensive with the uh, econo economic growth and bring it into the, to the debate on uh, the climate protection. So this is how this is, has an impact on how we develop climate protection strategies. So we have three different measures, bundles of measures that we're talking. One, efficiency. Second, uh, other forms of uh, sub energy supply. And the third, which is technologies for negative emissions and and this, uh, Barbara Unmusik has already said, that we have these geoengineering, we have to be skeptical about this, because uh, this is, we, we, uh, we refuse this as friends of the earth. We're also critical of the subject, and also the BECs with the bioenergy use, because it, because it needs such large surfaces for growing biomass. It would be practically a third of the agricultural services. This would lead to further, you know, sort of like erosion of forests and also sort of like food security if we just kept growing uh, biomass and it would also be, bi you know, monocultures and we'd be disturbing biodiversity just to store 
CO2. That means that these, uh, this point of approach, we have to look behind. How are we going to, are we going to get CO2 down in the atmosphere? How are we going to get it out of the atmosphere? This is false. We have to start with the causes and not with the, uh, with the symptoms. And this, this is why in the IPCC there was nothing, this wasn't dealt with in the IPCC report. You know, that we don't need to deal with it with better uh, technological products but we also have to change our way of being and behaving. This isn't dealt with in the report, and of course there's a reason for this, because changing people's behavior, this, uh, has, a, this has a negative influence on economic growth. So if you, if you, if you need uh, c products that can be repaired, then you've got to find new things to produce. You know, so like you need less products, and if you, ha if you have more sustainable products, then you have less production. So this, we have to examine this uh, urgently, and this is what insufficiency. How much is enough? Couldn't couldn't we have a reduction of all of this? Reduction of production of material goods and services, and we could still live well. And even in our highly developed industrial countries, it's that that we could we could have one we could have one percent economic growth, would necessarily is that enough? We have to we have to divide this. Uh, otherwise, this is another question. But I believe that in the industrial countries, we have to evolve into a post-growth uh, society when we want to continue freedom to attain ecological uh, targets and not always break put the brakes on when this uh, we when the the argument comes on the table. You know, we need economic growth, etc. This. Uh, we ha we have to uh, give more strength to the economic uh, the environmental boundaries arguments how can we have a highly performing society that doesn't depend on economic growth thank you very much so it's so we have to find the right measure is there a direct question for angelica san's uh, presentation then Thank you very much, first of all, and we're going to see you straight away afterwards. So, so even if the old people couldn't get out, uh, Thomas Martin, you know, sort of like, uh, you know, because the, you know, sort of like when people can't go outside in Spain because water is so expensive, then you're going to realize what the problem is. A colleague who said this, the, who was giving out about the federal government not doing enough for the environment, or when thousands or many millions of people really durably keep coming north, then of course they were going to start acting. They're going to be, then there's, you know, we're just going to have to change our habits and not just one or two. We're talking about really existential questions. And this Pierman Spiegel really deals with this very well. She's the, she's uh, the president of uh, Miserio since 2012, and and he also was also uh, called Monsignore, and I'm going to say it. He worked a lot in Brazil. Now he gets involved all over the world against uh, poverty in the world, and what we can do here has consequences for everywhere. So if you can give us your overview on climate change, thank you. Yeah. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, with you know, sort of like I'm just going to have two preliminary remarks for, and then going to talk to you for the next couple of minutes. Uh, three months ago, before Paris in 2015, I was sitting with uh, Filipinos and people from Papua New Guinea. And we were just we were discussing about uh, uh, env environmental alliances all over the world. We were talking about two degrees, and the people from uh, Philippines and Papua New Guinea said to me, "One point five degrees." And and for the the macro is the protection for from tsunami. We were planting, and if we can't manage to get to one point five degrees, these forests are going to be gone. And we have to, there are very clear connections with uh, lifestyles and the consequences for people all the other parts of the world that we don't even know. That's the, in two weeks ago, I was in Brussels with, with two indigenous people and other people with the com co Commissioner for International Cooperation and Development. And we, 
we talked with five ambassadors, and uh, these old people, these people were all from the Amazon. And I heard the following thing, and that's why this uh, we were talking about the protections and the reserve res reserve with respect reservation with respect to uh, economic. But we have to discuss about we have to discuss about human rights, but we have to ta also take economic uh, economic conditions into account. And why is there a link between this? I'm going to talk about this uh, with you in the next couple of minutes. So I'm convinced that in the last uh, decades, uh, we're going to the next decades we're going to be we're at the we're at the divide here in the next months and the next years. If we're going to if in our uh, societies are we going to change our lives or or we're or is our environment going to become an inhospitable place? I'm talking about this because I work with people who live in the north of Brazil. I learned that 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 when I talk about the environment, I'm not in the centre, but it's the word about me. But when then I'm saying I'm one of the people of the living creatures on the earth who lives with all the others. And there's a big difference between the two. Mit, uh, you know, sort of like the environment, uh, and w with that, and the environment that's not anthropocentric. And uh, we we sincerely hope that the massive limitation of emissions can attain this target, and when we can manage to get that. So, if we have climate protection with other environment, if we deal with uh, climate protection with other environmental protections, and also poverty, and I'm always that I'm very, very happy to hear that everything is cross-cutting and linked. An example that, for example, that there was a storm that wasn't really reported. It occurred on the 13th of February on the mining region of the Insel Sarigal in the Philippines. That the water. The masses of water fell on uh, deforested earth, and because you know, because it was deforested by mining companies, and so the water couldn't soak into the ground, so slid down the hill. And while it was doing that, it, it upripped tree stumps, and then the tree stumps were swept down the hill, and they were responsible for the deaths of many people. So this was just one little small catastrophe, and it didn't even get into the media, it didn't even get into the news in Germany and in Europe partners of us who live in the partners, they said so. And, you know, sort of like the whole country was reporting on this. But this means that... So these are various fates that are linked with uh, climate change. We, never, we don't even hear about them, but we know that they have consequences, that the consequences are even getting stronger because of poverty and other environmental problems. And it, the impact is always greatest for the people who have least contributed to climate change. And uh, the, this is sort of like the Pope Francisco who said, who said this type of economy is killing people because it doesn't think about people, and it doesn't think about the per it doesn't think about long-term perspectives. That means, mark you know, sort of like market, market and competition shouldn't be a purpose per se. We have to society have to find a, a re framework for this, and we have to make sure that they serve the common good of humanity. And so, if we're talking about, and you know, sort of like. It's you know, sort of like the economy is also sort of like uh, uh, violating human rights. That of course the sort of like the sort of like you know sort of like the our federal government here isn't at the forefront, but is at the is a, is a, is slacking if you like. And if you're talking about if you're talking about living conditions, that if you want to protect these, then sort of like if somebody wants to denounce this, then there it's a dangerous life in a lot of countries to do this job. And all over the world, there were 200 victims of attacks connected with. Uh, their uh, commitment to cli you know protecting the environment and so if you're talking about closed spaces or shrinking spaces this is also related to so people who are so people who are they were persecuted and prosecuted and the families were threatened and they so people who they lost their They've lost their living conditions. They've lost experiences. You've, you don't know how you, we lose experience about how you can sustainably work with forests and land. And uh, I was in Ethiopia and I saw pastoralists or the shepherds. They're, you know, they, they move around all the time. They're nomadic. And so they, they c cultivate the landscape and they buy, and they, they really help the, the, 
and then we and then we have uh, then we have minors, for example. We get rid of what, wisdom, cultural cultural experience, and also other experience. So the sort of like when we lived with the and you know sort of like we talk about biological diversity, biodiversity. And this is the same thing for small farming families, for example. They, they, most of the time, they have eco-friendly principles, even if we don't talk it. And they have, you know, sort of like locally adapted and uh, local, uh, you know, sort of like uh, different types of fruits, different types of seeds, and different types of cultures. We did a study on this that proved that this type of mixed culture, this type of sort of like having a seed bank, that was more resilient than against against epidemics, against uh, against uh, fluctuating food prices, and they, we find them all the time in the discourse, and the, we try to get this into the e European and German discourse. And in his new encyclical, uh, Pope Francis said, "In the we looking after our common home," and I learned I had a draft of this that about the maintaining of living quality on our planet. And he criticizes, we've talked about this on the technical studies, you know, so like we've heard about this and you've, uh, you've talked about this, uh, you've given us lots of examples. In some of the worlds, we're going to have to downsize a little bit in order to give other people help so that in that part of the world we can progress. And we also have to, when we're talking about growth, we have to see it in a very different, differentiated way. And I, that, that, you know, that, you know, sort of like climate protection and human dignity and human rights are not negotiable. And the Pope has talked about to, talked to industrial countries and talking about, you know, sort of like climate measures and, and also about adaptation measures, mitigation measures, but you've got to do it for and with the people on, on, the, on the ground, as it were. And maybe you know about this, Ecuador, when you know, sort of like you can't have new natural protected areas because then you you get lawsuits from companies who because there's investor protection agreements, or you've got small farmers in Burkina Faso because they've got uh, climate resilient onions, but then they're flooded then by imports of cheap Dutch onions. That shows that climate protection, that you know, sort of like. Uh, uh, economic uh, economic interests, sort of like commercial policy and everything, you have to look at all of these together in a cross-cutting manner. Uh, and we have to find a way of uh, doing this properly. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a, this is a clear wake-up call. This, uh, when you know, sort of like we're talking about 50, the time has come for a for a, a turnaround in our way of perceiving the environment and the economy, then, you know, we, we and we did a survey on this, uh, the more than 50 countries, what do they mean by a good life? And the good thing was, is that the answers weren't, the answers weren't material growth, more, more growth, more cars, more, but we were talking about respect, tolerance, uh, delicateness, love, freedom. It, it really gave me a lot of hope that in our DNA of humanity, that there's something, you know, we, the, you know, we've got something within us all that wants to tend in another direction. And in Germany and in other parts of the world, we're asking about these, uh, you know, sort of like, well, there's an increase in the post-growth uh, discourse. You know, we can live otherwise or in a different way. We participate in the search for for other people. We work in uh, 92 countries with people together, and we try to we try to introduce the discourse on post growth with partners on other continents, and so that there's an exchange and discussion on the subject. In the last, I met Barbara Hendricks at the last meeting, and so we were. Why d she talked about 1.5 uh, degrees a couple of years ago. So we know we know we know that we have to deal with biodiversity properly because we need the this d extra DNA for life qualities. We need to learn from other people, and we also have to learn. And so I'm going to conclude here. So the cultural change is going to be a long-term process. I think we all agree with this. That's why it's important that once they have needs for I uh, ideas and we need to implement these measures, you are talking about get getting out of fossil fuels, having a different agricultural model, and 
we have to have different, you know, sort of like not a, a plant-based uh, foods, foodstuffs rather than animals. And sort of like we were talking as well, the Burgermeister of Bogota, who said, Perman, development doesn't mean that the poor people that the poor people have to drive cars, but that rich people take public transport. Wonderful. So I'm going to conclude. We need this pressure, we need this debate, like we're doing it here this evening, in order to attain 1.5, to stay with it. I've got three points. Uh, to sort of like you have this, uh, and we have to. I have to do it for our for our environment. We have to do it for the future generate. And because I think that uh, you know, sort of like as people, I think we deserve to we deserve to do this so that we can live with each other properly. First, thank you very much. Auch hier die Frage: Gibt es direkte Fragen? Eine direkte Frage. There is a direct question here. Is there a direct question? No, I don't see that. So, uh, Welthungerhilfe has uh, published a uh, World Hunger Index today. Uh, 800 million people and more have nothing to eat. The climate change, wars are root causes. We heard we have to change uh, economy. How can we do that? Uh, which need to uh, use mass transport more. And we heard. And then the question is, how do we want to live? And uh, that's why we need everyone. And Johann Röckström, Angelika Zahnt, Pim in Spiegel. I would like to ask me, ask uh, you to join me here on stage. And Barbara Unmusik uh, will also join us on the panel because she's been dealing for 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 long what what uh, economic model we need. Uh, her here, her book, uh, Critics of Green Reason, is a very famous book. So how can we um, make progress with the green economy promise and uh, not too far, we heard. Uh, so I would like to ask all of you here <coughs> to join me here on stage. Yeah. Barbara Unmusi, let's start with you. It is not so easy. It is easier um, um, to talk about technology solutions and rather than, no, don't uh, eat so much meat, and uh, uh, no, don't uh, uh, wear uh, uh, thick coats and not, not um, put on the radiator. So how can you get out of this debate? Um, well, politize uh, l lifestyles, uh, I call it this way. It should be a very important strategy of the civil society. It is a strategy of our civil society. Uh, we, I take pride in the fact that the Heinrich Böll Foundation um, has already publicized four meat atlases. And uh, we have uh, really uh, um, brought momentum into the debate. Why does my meat consumption has to do something with uh, farmers in Brazil, Uruguay, Paraguay, etc. And people are interested in that. We have uh, um, distributed more than 500,000 copies of this meat atlas. So it's more than 10,000. Uh, my book <laughs> had a m mini circulation. I want to talk about that. Um, so it is worthwhile, I'm, I want to say, um, to um, to make an effort uh, to uh, educate people how our lifestyle uh, has an impact on other people's lives. So the textiles campaign is relevant here. So all of these campaigns that we're having um, uh, are relevant here. What I would wish for is that those people working on these uh, 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 issues uh, join forces. We have a cocoa campaign, a sugar campaign, a textiles campaign, a what have you campaign. But in all these campaigns, uh, the central issue is that we want to educate people that we are responsible for uh, abusing, exploiting others. Imperial lifestyles is it what we're living here. And I uh, welcome the fact that currently there is a little turning point uh, because uh, Merkel is not a pioneer in climate change and uh, people uh, grasp it you now that the Germans are 
pioneers. Or well, because we separate uh, waste and stuff. No. Uh, no, no, we're no, no, pi no, we're not pioneers. We are, are world champions in terms of lignite uh, thermal uh, use uh, in uh, throwing away uh, clothing and what have you. We are world champions in also many areas. Johann Rockström. Uh, there needs to be lots of convincing to be done, uh, specifically with the federal government. Uh, they still believe uh, that there is to be growth. Uh, 200 researchers had an open letters. We have to get away from growth philosophy. Um, uh, of course, scientists, uh, sometimes you hear that you shouldn't believe their facts. Uh, why didn't you sign that letter? Well, actually, I had a very um, intense discussion with many of the initiators of the letter. I'm very close friend and colleagues with um, several of them, like uh, Kate Raworth and Tim Jackson. Many of them are the strongest proponents of planetary boundary science. But I must admit, and um, this is a, a strong conviction I have, I think we've made a mistake in the environmental movement over the last 50 years to create a deep, deep conflict between growth and sustainability. And I think it has taken us absolutely nowhere because it really creates this sense that as long as we communicate that sustainable development is a sacrifice, it's the willingness to pay, it is how far are you willing to, to back off from a good life, then we will fail. You will always penetrate roughly 15% of society. We show it in all modern societies, Germany included, Sweden included, that if you only are building a willingness to pay and awareness and willing to, so to say, to step back from what is perceived as being kind of good human well-being, you penetrate roughly 15% of society. If you want to tip the whole society, the only way to succeed is that the journey to sustainability becomes the desirable, the advanced, the modern, the attractive. And then I think the growth discussion is, in that sense, the wrong discussion. Mm -hmm. However, that said, with, with the conventional definition of growth, I fully support that it does not at all uh, no, so say, align itself with planetary boundaries in any way. And mature industrial societies are certainly leveling off into a degrowth future anyway. But the poorest nations need growth to be able to stand any chance to lift themselves out of poverty. So there's, there's something to be very careful about here when discussing Ang growth. Angelika Zahn, machen Sie da womöglich einen Fehler? Erst haben Sie das Wachstum nicht berücksichtigt, das haben Sie als Irrtum... Did, did you make a mistake then, Angelika Zahn? Uh, do you make a mistake now? Or if you now claim uh, no growth anymore because you don't get the people on board? I, d I didn't say uh, uh, stop growth, but rather uh, it make yourself independent of economic growth and uh, like uh, pension plans, uh, uh, work uh, a labor market to create it such that uh, there is no dependence. How can you do that? If we have productivity gains, which is something positive, um, have the same amount of products and services with less people uh, employed, um, not say, uh, oh, they're becoming unemployed, now we need to be growing in other sectors so that these people get a new job. No, we rather have to think uh, in terms of how to shorten work times, for example, so that people have something to do, uh, but uh, us not needing to produce more uh, services and products on top in order to keep the employment levels. Work time uh, reduction would be in a means to uh, decrease that growth uh, pressure. And I'm welcoming the trade union stance, if they haven't done anything for, for long, uh, that they go in this direction. It is important, it's good, because people uh, feel this permanent pressure, this stress is not good for them. So there is a desire for less work, for less uh, work time. Uh, that trade unionists want less of it and they want more family time. Um, so not just look at uh, increase your salary, but rather um, opportunities for shorter work time. So more leisure time. But Permin Spiegel, there's a huge problem. Climate change affects the entire world. Uh, behaviorists say step by step, issue by issue, how uh, 
how do you come to a situation where you where you don't have the feeling oh it's just bigger than me I can't do anything why should I use uh, uh, the subway now now all those diesel uh, engine drivers will so soon learn uh, what mass transit uh, means um, uh, uh, well, in the countryside, it's difficult, isn't it? Well, nutrition is political. Clothing is political. Mobility is political. We heard that. If we keep working on these issues, it's not about us. It's about uh, living models. Um, I, I learned uh, from partners there's a lot of uh, talk about deceleration uh, and the opposite of acceleration is not deceleration but relationships space room for relationship for uh, get get away from the job I, I don't want to live without relationships without contacts to other people without a community there is not the solution. There is a whole host of solutions. And if we bring all these solutions together, uh, we get an, on the right track uh, to, to have uh, more relationship, more politicization then. Yeah, some may nod here in this room, but outside there are people who have a different view. And there is the youth who serve the web and meet people who uh, sell, 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 day in, day out. What do you tell them? Do you need new role models? Of course um, you, you do. Uh, it's good that uh, people from Hollywood uh, try to be role models. There's all kinds of role models. But uh, honestly, um, I don't have an answer for everything. Uh, that's part of the truth, huh? <laughs> and we are in a, you know, we are in a finding process here, and I see just, I, I see two trends currently. Um, uh, father, faster, what have you, uh, um, condense, and uh, there's a trend of young people. They say less, slower. I'm I'm a boss of a uh, medium-sized organization, uh, by the way. So we have more part-time work now, not because um, uh, we want to have a better uh, life, uh, uh, work-life balance. We have lots of uh, men uh, doing half-time. I have a son of mine who says I don't uh, work like you do. So I can only uh, uh, subscribe to what uh, Angelica was saying. There is a wish for better quality of life, which is independent of work, 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 and speed, speed, speed. However, I don't know what I should be doing then, except a prohibition. Um, if I want to prevent uh, one Primark branch opening up, one after the other. We had that in Steglitz, now we have them at the station at the zoo. There you have the t-shirts for 2 99 And if you ask uh, uh, what you do with this stuff, uh, and then uh, these consumers say, well, every, every time I go to the party, I buy a party, I go to a new t-shirt. So, so uh, we're not, uh, you know, distributing flyers before Primark like we did that before the uh, factory gates w when we were young. So, what? A, so it's like with the energy paradoxon. There is more investment into renewables worldwide. At the same time, the fossil run and hustle continues, and we just simply don't manage to get the bend, um, so Roksham so nicely uh, depicted. Angelika Zahnt, could you derive from other societal movements and uh, uh, developments what you could do? Is there other uh, developments in society where we thought, oh, we'd never get a majority, and at the end we got a majority? Well, prohibition of a uh, ban, ban on smoking, for example. A tobacco industry was uh, against it, uh, did a heavy lobbying. But then when uh, um, the figures came out, uh, like passive smoking, how that affected the health of uninvolved uh, 
kids suffering. Then there was all of a sudden that movement, which was nonpartisan, bringing about a ban on smoking. And I would wish the same for a tempo limit, uh, speed limits here. Uh, that is, the arguments are obvious. It's good for the climate protection. But the automotive industry doesn't want that because they uh, like speed driving and stuff and not 130 or something. That's why uh, so we should take individual issues and exert pressure so that the political action is taken. I know you have a different thinking. Uh, private is political, but the political conditions need to be set. Uh, that's important. And if the prices are such that this cheap flight into all kinds of destinations worldwide is no longer that dirt cheap, but rather uh, reflects the um, externalized costs, then uh, then people may not uh, fly that much. And meat, if it becomes more expensive, um, for example, because of a meat tax or an increased value add tax on meat, it would have an effect. So I believe it is po important to have a political uh, condition set and that uh, people that are politically committed not just to change their own uh, lifestyle for credibility, but also become politically active. I have been dealing with ecotax for so long, you know, worldwide. Everybody now pleads for a worldwide ecotax, and de facto nothing is done about it. That was a very evil debate. Uh, Angela Merkel was in the opposition at the time, and did an anti-eco Christmas calendar with 24 uh, arguments against eco tax. Johan Rockström, German politicians love action plan. If there was a three-point action plan on climate protection, what would have to be in that? One, two, three. Yeah, and let me say that I, I strongly support a climate action plan, and I think that what comes out also in this conversation is that you have to have a comprehensive set of different methods to achieve your goals. So I would take three very, very different measures. And the first one is that I would strongly suggest the German government, as the Swedish government and the European government, to set science-based targets for phase-out of fossil fuel-driven energy systems in society. And this is very challenging because it would mean actually setting basing a, a, an end date on, on, for example, having internal combustion engines, having an end date on fossil fuel driven domestic aircrafts, having end dates to couple with, with the scientific journal. So that, that I think is one. The reason why I think this is very healthy is that that would send the right signals into the business community so they know what the level of Gordon Moore type innovation they have to follow. The second is I fully agree on eco, eco taxes. Mm -hmm. You need to have internalized externalities and set the right price on carbon. Sweden has had, can you believe it, a price on carbon since 1990 of 100 euros per ton of carbon dioxide. 100. I mean, even economists would perceive that today as being almost an exorbitantly high level. It has decoupled the economy, and we are not uh, poorer nor unhealthier since, since we did that. And the third um, element of this is I would set up uh, a, a kind of a, a compulsory investment fund mechanism where every revenue on climate tax goes into that fund to be reinvested into innovations to take us towards that decarbonized future. So that voters can feel that if I pay tax for a sustainable future, that money goes back into investing into an even better sustainable future. And those three are, is what I would say. Das wird allerdings nicht von alleine kommen, sondern da that will not uh, be automatic. Uh, there will not be automatic. There's many people that have to raise their voices, and that's what is the cue for you. Who hasn't had an opportunity to raise a question here? There is a roving mic here for questions, so please use it. I've got two things here. This affluence uh, uh, question here. We know that with our lifestyle, we would need three planets. So it is known. So our lifestyle is wrong. That is to be a basic realization. 
a principled one. And if we continue, we have seen all these graphs here. Then uh, the only thing uh, that is uh, um, then possible is that some part of the globe needs to uh, needs to um, uh, suffer from hunger. So we are. It's our fault that others suffer, and I hear all the time that we need to be doing something. So look, I um, I have the system question. Who is responsible for this? Who is the driver doing this? That is, we are, it's not in the discussion here. It's the it's our e economy, um, which leads to this. So we n need to say, look, economy, you can't continue this way. It's it's all profit. It's all profit maximization and and. So we need to change the profit question. Permin Spiegel, can we turn this system around? Is that the question? Is I'm 60 years old now. I learned. Mr. Rockström, you said clear end date fossil fuel phase out. Germany can do that. Um, all fossil fuel stuff is, is phased out here. But you're importing uh, Colombia and South African coal at the same time. So we must not say local and uh, national um, um, policies and forget about long-term uh, um, contracts that we have already struck in order to exploit coal long-term worldwide. And then the system uh, uh, issue here. Um, you don't know an answer to everything. Um, in our organization, uh, we are quite clear that it is about uh, the system. You have that overshoot day here. For uh, Germany, we would need four planets even. We'll live within the system. Even though I have so many system questions, there's some it's a frenetic uh, situation here, and I uh, can't escape it uh, personally because my lifestyle um, uh, for that I would need m way more than one planet. Um, a system change will not fall from the skies, um, but I know that the atmosphere belongs to everyone, so the the sky is political. <laughs> That's what we will take away here. <laughs> That was uh, from uh, a sentence from a member of staff of, of Potsdam Institute that the sky belongs to all. So, um, uh, so the ambassador in the Amazon. So the economic uh, interests prevail over uh, human interest, and uh, so we are powerless. But I still hope that we we manage. Uh, questions, comments, recommendations, food for thought. Of Deutsch, of jeden Fall. Okay. My question goes to Johann Röck from Gregor Hagedorn Natural Science uh, Museum. Thanks for this fantastic talk. Um, you said this uh, message must go out. Um, concrete question, therefore. These nice graphs, not every photo, but uh, it could could you make that available on an open license? Uh, an open license makes it possible to use it in Wikipedia. Um, uh, and there are so many nice means of communication from science which are then not available. The wedding cake is not available for us, the, the one you uh, were mentioning. I uh, would like to praise the Heinrich Böll Stiftung, the Energy Atlas, the Meat Atlas, all under open license. Maybe you can't uh, give me an answer to the question, but maybe you can give me some rough cut estimation. I can give you a direct answer. I mean, uh, just, just like uh, the sky is owned by everyone. My slides are also to be shared by everyone. 
I, I'm a public servant. I'm a servant of the global common good. So I'd love to just share it and spread it and get as much momentum and dialogue as we ever can. I think that is one key element of this journey to get the, the, the real movement going. So I can assure you that nothing makes me more happy than Wedding using Cake the wedding. for alle. Wunderbar. <laughs> Gibt es weitere Fragen? Bitte schön, hier vorne. Thank you. Thank you. My question is a political question, brother. Everything you do is uh, clear, but also discomforting and calls for radical solutions. I am activist in the Gelände, so we, uh, you know, insist on immediate phasing out of coal. Um, the IPCC report, you can interpret it such and say uh, it, it cannot be combined with capitalism. Can it be combined with a democracy? Question mark. I mean, um, how can we uh, um, get scope which our democracy needs? How can we uh, retain an open uh, um, society that's worthwhile maintaining? Barbara Unmusik, that's to you, directly. We are active in 33 countries worldwide. And the uh, conditions we see, uh, the, the dismantling of political rights, what we see in terms of repression of our political partner, as our Mezierio is witnessing, that is really uh, horrifying. Those who uh, oppose the destruction of their livelihood, these are the people that are most threatened. We have most killings, uh, specifically in Latin America, and very frequently in together with mining, dams, uh, huge uh, agricultural land grabs, what have you. Um, so it is a problem. And uh, it is with great horror uh, that I look to Brazil, where <coughs> a, a fascist, a violent guy, is uh, at the brink of becoming Brazilian president. And if I bring that with the tipping points in the Amazon, uh, then I can only tell you, uh, I can only be realistic and very pessimistic. What uh, uh, encourages me at the same time is that repre repression we see worldwide is a response to people standing up. Uh, there's so many protests worldwide now where people now uh, fight and stand up, and they need our publicity, they need our solidarity. So, uh, so that not just uh, catastrophes uh, uh, hit the headlines, but also these fights hit the headlines, which are sometimes successful. And it is with horror uh, that I see that also in Germany, scope is shrinking. It's not just happening uh, elsewhere. And it also happens in Poland, in Hungary, in Austria. It happens everywhere. It is horrible if a Lega Nord um, man becomes boss of uh, public TV in, in Italy. So there's no positive news I can share with you, unfortunately, at this point. But I have the f hope. And I subscribe to what you're saying, Mr. Spiegel. I, li I like what you're saying. People strive not just for more money, but for human dignity, freedom, love, respect. Uh, and and uh, and that's what I count on. It will prevail at the end, I'm 100% certain. But we need to make a contribution to uh, hear them, see them, invite them here, so give them a voice so that they are protected. Next question. Could you comment on China? Uh, democracy, economic growth. Barbara Unmüssig, you, somebody, Angelika Zahnd. Oh, there's a microphone. We would need a microphone. Briefly, on economic growth. In China, there's some rethinking here. Uh, ever more um, growth rates. 
uh, well, higher growth rates. You don't have that uh, that much anymore because it, it is obvious what the consequences are for the environment. About uh, um, um, toxicated soils, etc., polluted uh, waters. There is resistance from the public. And even a regime like the Chinese now feels that you can't continue like that for forever. And that's why they try to uh, reduce the growth targets and count more on environmental protection. So this uh, absolute growth for economic, uh, absolute yearning for economic growth has been reduced, uh, shrunk a bit, I think. China is on a way to a totalitarian state period. And uh, China uh, is courted by us as a partner in climate protection. Yes, they are our partner, but we couldn't close our eyes before the fact what character that system has that, um, that surveils all of his uh, 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 citizens day in, day out. And uh, for, me, for me, it is fairly obvious that the transformation we need has to be uh, this three-pronged approach, uh, democratic, inclusive, social. And we have to fight for these democratic rights and not support eco-dictators uh, and uh, applaud when they do the odd good thing every once in a while. So. Uh, of course, if China invests more into renewables, that's okay. But nonetheless, the human rights and the democracy questions have to be uh, 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 mentioned uh, and raised in that. There's one last, one more question. <laughs> Hello. For a year, we have a new party in the Bundestag that uh, caused change. And they are very active in climate protection. I uh, um, look at their speeches and the AFD Internet Forum. They have a completely different language. And if there is this massive doubt of scientists, fake news debates, alternative facts spread through uh, Facebook, um, of course you could say it's 15%. You could ignore these guys. Or uh, now other parties, uh, political parties, are impressed by them. So the IPCC report is not a report that is read by everyone and understood by everyone. Uh, Permit Spiegel, do you have an answer to that? <laughs> I need your help. I, I tell you what I try to do against this. With many others, we're going into the pubs, into the streets. I talk to people. Um, what we debate here tonight, I try to bring it to these to these places, uh, uh, raise understanding. If I do an SDG talk and I ask in a, in a train station, anybody SDGs? Everybody say no. If I ask uh, inequality, e equity, human rights, yes, then people know. Uh, uh, you must not underestimate here the political sensitivity Um, that the path we are uh, going is not uh, is not sustainable. But the answers uh, are, are very. And of course, this party we can't do with this. Uh, Johann Rockschmidt, how do you talk to right wing people and with uh, um, uh, climate uh, change deniers? May um, may surprise you a bit, but but I it it, it comes out of um, decades of. Um, of trial and error and painful engagement with climate skeptics and climate denialists and, and, and right-wing nationalist populism. And I've come to the conclusion it's not worth engaging. I don't care about them. We don't have time to wait for them. We don't have time to spend 
very valuable energy on trying to convince inconvincible individuals, and they are a minority. And in a normal distribution of population, as I mentioned earlier, you have always 15%, which I would argue are us in this room, basically, the aware, the engaged, the frontier. But in the other end, you always have 15%. That happened to be, quite interestingly, the climate denialists happen to also be, generally, the right-wing nationalists, populists, denialists. Uh, you know, it's quite interesting how, how these parameters coincide. I can tell you in the Nordics, another parameter that coincides in this group is that they tend to be male and they tend to be retired. You, you, you don't find young people questioning the science on climate change and wanting to really reconnect to a sustainable future. I, I'm kind of just bored and tired by this, um, often vocal, but it's a, <clears throat> it is a kind of a waste of time. And, and of course, that is not a very good answer because we have to do, as, as you point out, speak, we have to continue to, to tell the truth, to really convince. But we have the joker card, we have the nice card, because not only do we have the card of truth in terms of risk, we have the card showing that the journey towards a decarbonized sustainable future is more attractive. That is our card. So that means that we have the joker card, which nobody else can play. I mean, and I think that is the, the reason why you can actually be quite, quite self-reassured in, in let's do our delivery and not get too bogged down by climate skeptics. Yeah. I would like to ask if we are many, we are very few, I said before, we take first those who are not... So, uh, it would be nice if we had many people uh, in included in the debate. So, we would continue with those uh, who haven't uh, uh, raised the question here. I am getting annoyed uh, about this discussion. We have an uh, election in Bavaria, and a positive development is such that the AFD goes down, uh, Green goes up, and the CSU gets a slap in the face. Um, and so it's also important to see where things develop positively and to note that. Most of the discussions here are my generation here, uh, and we that have been in the discussion here in, in, in the issue for 20, 30 years, we are stuck in our own discourses. I had a very interesting uh, uh, discussion, uh, observation, global health strategy of the government. Uh, five experts um, work together, um, and use was clearly defined. They mentioned climate uh, uh, change. And for those who have been in the discussion here, been on the issue for 30, 40, 50 years, that we listen to the young people and that they lead the way. Because the way we do it, we kill the discussion the way we've been doing this discussion here. That is a very nice outlook. We take this as a statement and not as a question. There is the next question. Well, I uh, am not necessarily young, sorry. But I would like to ask about the BRIC states. What... <sighs> If we reduce the l low growth we already have, what's, what, um, what will others win globally? Uh, wouldn't it be better to interfere elsewhere, even though I don't know how? And also the question about democracy. How can that be done without uh, bans, without prohibition, uh, if we want to reduce levels here? And uh, not only Angela Merkel is is, is not moving. Um, there's resistance in in the general public if uh, consumption is more expensive, becomes more expensive. Angela, what do you do then? Uh, I would uh, contradict. We say low growth rate. One percent of our high gross domestic product uh, corresponds to 10% of growth in China, you know, from a much lower baseline. 
That's why this thinking in growth rates is erroneous already. Mathematically, if you start from a high level, then a low growth rate, uh, also in absolute terms, in CO2 emission is something enormous. First point. Second point. We need to show that we could run a good life with low economic growth. So that in the developing countries, we need to grow for people to run a decent life, but can't have uh, the illusion of reaching uh, our economic production level. Uh, so we need to be doing two things. W with our economies, we need to prove that it is possible with less energy and less resources and at the same time that we can still lead a good life with a lower economic output, you know, and that's the re the challenge. And so uh, it's not about uh, the CO2 um, uh, cutting in Germany in absolute terms, but rather what uh, is the effect on other countries. So are there other questions from people who haven't spoken before, please? So thank you. I don't know. I think I don't know who's the youngest in the run, but I think, but I, th I seem younger anyway. I have a question for her, Mr. Rockstrom. You've you've spoken about you've spoken about negative things. I'd like a positive. I'd like a positive example of technology. Could you give us one or two things out of your experience that can show us that have a positive influence? and uh, things that you've worked on, things that you know, and uh, things that technology has actually brought about. Could you give us a, an update on that, please? Well, I, I, I tried to give one very basic example, which is the exponential rise in, in different forms of renewable energy, solar voltaics and, and wind. I would argue that we are decisively moving into direction to, to, to the point so decisively, actually, it's not a question if we will decarbonize the world energy system, it's a question, will we do it fast enough? And that we are seeing a very attractive, technologically advanced, modern and healthy future, healthy for both people and planet, of an electric-driven mobility sector in the world in our, in our lifetime. So that's, that's one. I think the second quite exciting development is we're, we're seeing now technological breakthroughs, for example, even in the advanced aluminium and steel industry to use um, hydrogen as your vehicle instead of coal for advanced steel production. And then there will be a paper coming out, I can tell you already now, in a few months' time, showing that we can scale wood-based construction technology, even at high-rise buildings, to transition away from concrete, another single big source of greenhouse gases, into doing the only, I would argue, biological carbon sink, which is more permanent, which is to build with wood. Then finally, in January, you'll have, or rather, two days ago, and in two months' time, you'll have scientific papers coming out showing that we can transition into healthy and sustainable food systems, which will be the single largest contribution to stay within the planetary boundaries. Right. That, that, that this is actually possible to do. So there are, there are so many, uh, so much evidence on, on opportunities. And, and I think that's what the discussion is here, that why are we sitting still not being able to unleash these transformations? How, how can we get the momentum? I think that's the big challenge. Not that we have the solutions, how do we get the momentum? Yes. So there are lots of positive examples. You can read them in the in the brochures. How to progress now? We're going to just have a short conclusion from here on the stage. Permanspiel, what what would you what can you hear? What do you think Pope Pope Francis is going to say about the 1.5 degree report? In particular. And so when we think about the most vulnerable, because uh, we have to all, you, you have to make sure that the most vulnerable have a, have a lifestyle that's compatible with ours. So the next person. So a climate protection plan that contributes to attaining the 1.5 degree target, Barbara, Barbara Unmusich. What do what do you say about L, what do you say about degrowth? With, with the microphone, please. So live differently with less uh, with less. 
Bruce, has Angela Merkel already rung you, Mr. Rockstrom? <laughs> but one day it's going to happen. She is going to meet you. What would you say to her? What would you? You're going to meet her one. You're going to meet her one day. What sentence? What one sentence would you say to Angela Merkel? A big opportunity to take Germany to the next level of healthy, sustainable modernity. Vielen Dank. Sie müssen sie treffen. Firmin Spiegel, Angelika. So, Firmin Spiegel, Barbara Unmusik, Johann Rockström. Thank you very much, Johann Rockström. Thank you very much. We've got we've got a small welcome present for you. We wish you every success with your new work, and uh, get in touch with us again. Thank you very much, and ladies and gentlemen. So, so that the planet doesn't become an inhospitable place. I think it's become very clear. Most of us already know it, but I do think that it's given us new impulsion and that there are going to be people who don't, more and more people who don't want to continue as it was before. I can see that it might be only a small thing, but I think that it's worth of noticing. So please, we're also twittering about uh, climate change. So Ersten Terley from SDF. So would, would climate change be the next thing before the courts? And we're already talking about the Netherlands, where there was, where there was an, um, an, um, an environmental group who brought the government to court that they need to do more about the environment. So things are going on. There's a lot being done. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for coming, for uh, discussing, for listening. Now there's going to be a, a, small, uh, a, a small glass of wine, and you can discuss things. And and thank, please th thank you very much as well to the interpreters. I don't think it's very easy for you. And please, the headsets, will you please give them back? And I hope that you all get safely home. Thank you very much. Goodbye. <laughs>